And welcome everybody to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners from around the world. Um, today I'm pleased to let you know I'm joined by three fantastic practitioners. Uh, we're joined by Paul Mitchell, who's uh, Head of Education at QPR Community Trust. Harry Varley is the uh, Head of Women's Football at Grenada FA. And with Paul Holichow, is the Academy Director at Houston Dynamo. Um, before I uh, introduce you to the guys properly, um, let me share my screen with you and uh, let you know what you can expect on today's Sunday session. So we will we'll be talking about growing football partition, participation pathways. Uh, once we get through the introductions, uh, Mitch, Harry and Paul will be giving their own presentations on their work within the community, QPR Community Trust, Grenada FA and Houston Dynamo, which then will lead uh, into our discussion around the first half. We'll be sort of focusing around the, the soccer starts at home, Tom Byers soccer starts at home, which is a huge part of what Paul is doing at Houston Dynamo and what are the key pillars of, of that. Um, and sort of evolving it around into then into the coaching methods, how with each of their programs, what are the styles of coaching that they're, they're adopting. And the second half, we're looking more then at the, the why, how, how that is, uh, what is the culture that they're promoting, how, what their programs are doing, how that is evolving their football cultures within their clubs and organizations. What are the benefits, gains and, and challenges to, to bring those programs out? So, if you have questions for the guys, please try and kind of fill them through there so we can keep that discussion flowing naturally. And we'll get through as many of those questions as we can. And so we can do that. Let me start introducing you to the guys. So uh, first up, uh, I'll start with uh, Paul Mitchell. Um, Paul, uh, how are you today? Not too far from me in London. All right, morning, Steve. Uh, good to be here. Thanks for uh, inviting me on. Um, like you say, here in London. <clears throat> um, just a quick introduction about myself. Uh, lucky enough to work with four pro clubs. Uh, lucky enough to work in an academy at Bournemouth alongside Eddie Howe when he was down there. And in three community um, trusts and foundations as well. Wickham, Crystal Palace, and now my home club, Queen's Park Rangers, which I'm... Um, you know, I'm living a dream, so I'm incredibly lucky. So thanks for the invite, Steve. No, no, you're, you're welcome. We're loving, loving, loving having you here, and yeah, certainly looking forward to hear how you're living that dream. Um, and talking of living dreams, uh, Harry Varley in Grenada, I believe it's a, another beautiful morning in paradise. Yes, it is indeed. Again, thank you for for having me on. Very excited to have the the conversation today. Um, a little bit about me. So I've been coaching kind of around the world for for the last. 10, 10 or so years. Currently been in Grenada for almost two years now. So uh, yeah, excited to, to talk about football as always. Good. Brilliant. Where, where, have you, where have your travels taken you, Harry? So previous to here, I was in the Cayman Islands. I was also in Uganda for, for almost three years. Uh, I had a stint in Mexico, New Zealand, Singapore, Cambodia. So yeah, almost yeah, five continents, still working on, on the last two. But it's been a good adventure so far. Okay, yeah. I can imagine you're in no rush to go to Antarctica, though. So. Not, not just yet, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll take the Caribbean sunrise that I got right now. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Um, finally, uh, Paul Holicher, uh, Academy Director at Houston Dynamo. Paul, how, how are you this morning? I believe it's very early for you, or earlier. Certainly earlier than it is for us. Yeah, it's um. Th thanks, Steve. Yeah, it's it's earlier. We're we're at six o'clock in the morning here in Houston. Um, but yes, um, my name is Paul Holliher. I'm the academy director for the Houston Dynamo of of Major League Soccer. Um, I've been here in Houston for uh, just over two and a half years now, and um, yeah, grew up in America. Um, played in the college system here in America and then played professionally here and, and a little bit in Europe. And then I came back and played in Major League Soccer before I started my coaching uh, journey. So I coached, uh, coached uh, in college for 15 years and then was with the San Jose Earthquakes, which is another Major League Soccer team 
uh, before coming here just uh, just under three years ago to uh, to oversee the academy um, in Houston. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing a lot more about the work that you're doing at Houston. But uh, for now, Paul, I'll just get you to take a, a back seat and we'll, we'll begin our presentations today with, with Mitch at QPR. So we'll hear a little bit more about your work, Mitch, uh, in the Community Trust at the Hoops. Thanks, Steve. All good there with the presentation? Yes, fantastic. It's all yours. Excellent. So, um, real key pillar for us, uh, particularly in schools and our education programmes, is going to be relationships. And I think that, that first slide kind of sums that up straight away. Um, what, what we really, really stick to is our whys, basically. So, the belief that people, and young people especially, deserve these four things is absolutely paramount to our delivery. Uh, within our education programs. Um, but we, we try and help young people go deeper into that flow to, to kind of have a loss of their separate self without kind of getting too deep. Uh, these four things kind of contribute to that. Um, and we always say if you stick to those four and reflect on whether you've kind of met those four in a session, then, uh, then you've done all right. Um, real key... You know, our technical detail comes from that needing a little help to be their best and uh, how we do individual coaching around that, um, something that we can discuss later on as well. Um, physical activity is really important to us, you know, particularly in Britain, we know that there's, there's an issue around obesity, so it's really important that that is there as one of our whys. And obviously, a little bit biased from my point of view, but becoming part of the the QPR family for life at any level, player, coach, supporter, uh, that's really key for us as well. The what and how is important to us. Um, but it, it's always underpinned by that why. So it's just a few bits and pieces in there, supporting the people's development. Always fun based, always physical as well. Uh, and how we do that is by supporting our staff in being that understanding ind individual and having those empathy skills. We work with so many different children across you know, kind of West and Northwest London, um, but everything's different on a day-to-day -day basis. We talk about our staff, because, and I talk about the staff, because they are the most important things for us as well. Um, and we expect them to be available, where it says there, and that's, that's part of that kind of emotional attachment to young people. Again, relationships are the most important thing for us and we believe that's what helps young people get better so we expect our staff to be that sort of relationship builder um, and and also be proud of what they do um, but act quickly when needed you know being innovative and we'll get onto some of that technical detail next and how we how we help individuals and groups and a lot of our work is game realistic so we try and make everything be you know as realistic, uh, re repetitive, and relevant to young people as we can. That includes our 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s. But it doesn't dismiss individual coaching as well. So we use uh, something called a goldfish bowl. So if we're working in a game situation, we'll have a little goldfish bowl on the side where we can take players out and they can work on a particular skill that we're working on in that game situation. And it's not so much pressurised, we take them out and then we put them back in and we get them to try and have a go. Ball familiarisation, as we'll talk about later, is huge for us, so everyone will have a ball. Um, it's really important for us, you know, we work alongside the national curriculum in schools, so the difference between PE and sport and how teachers perceive the difference between physical education and sport is really, really important. Our four wise, like I said there, is really important and that underpins everything we do, uh, making sure we're developing a person before a player in our under 18 college college programs. You know, we talk to the, the boys and girls and we say, well, one thing will make you as polite, you know, and that, that's the sort of getting people ready for the world as well as becoming a potential footballer. A lot of our work in education is based around the key stages here. So you've got your four, four to seven key stage one and then up to kind of key stage four at 15 and 16, and then key stage five and uh, further education. 
We've started to bring in a lot of work around challenges within matches and gamification, which is a lot of work that Amy Price has done um, with the FA, where uh, we relate the games that we play to video games and levelling up uh, and, you know, getting to the big boss at the end and how can you defeat that big boss with a challenge. And then obviously working so deep within a community and, and working for a club that genuinely cares about the people that live around the stadium. We face huge social issues as well. Children can live in the same bar and be very different, even within the same school, facing very, very different challenges. Um, we always try and make it play like a child, no matter, no matter what age, even in our adult sessions. And we try and develop that inner sense of freedom as well for young people. And there's our four whys again. You know, the, the reason it's in there again is because it's underpins everything we do and it's the most important thing for us um, the coaches like i said if they can reflect and they've met those at the end of a session then we always say then uh, we'll be pleased with what you've done fantastic thanks for sharing that paul yeah it's a uh, yeah nice quick overview of of the work uh, you're doing at qpr and looking forward to delving a little bit deeper into that as we as we progress with this sunday session um now i'd like to uh, hand the screen over to harry varley and, and hear about your work uh, around the world and, and now in in grenada everyone seen we there yep it's uh, up on screen it's uh, all yours harry take it away so I'm going to speak a little bit more broadly than just the, the program that I'm on at the moment, um, because I think through my travels, I have seen the challenges um, and, and kind of learned a lot about what it is to develop a football program. And essentially, when we're starting from scratch, which in a lot of the environments that I've been in, you have to work through a lot of, of the socio-cultural details the the factors that surround football before you can find a program that's really going to enhance and benefit the participants um, and moving on to my kind of second slide especially in the elite environment especially when we're, we're looking at working with the best players and at national team level as I do now and, and the program that I had in Uganda where we were selecting the best kids from Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, South Sudan. The big thing that started to come out for me was, was the recruitment processes and how, how is that done? Is there enough emphasis put on it? I mean, I had a belief when I started coaching, I, I really held it in my head that if you had the best coaches and you were doing the best training sessions, that was the missing ingredient. That was a factor that was gonna change the game. And what I saw is sometimes in Uganda, we would drive out into the middle of the bush. We would go 30 kilometers off the main road and then you would have to go by foot for the, the final 5K. And you'd find a kid that had never worn a pair of football boots, never played with a proper football. They were using kind of plastic bags that had been rolled together. But their first touch was as good as anything you'd ever see. Their game instinct was there. And so are your processes as a football program identifying those environments, those uh, could be a family environment, could be a, a part. So what I've noticed a lot is that there tends to be areas of the country or even districts, neighborhoods where football is the lifeblood. And that's where you need to be doing your recruitment. You need to find out where they're talking about football every day. There's a football at the feet of young people. And especially here in Grenada where Young people are not really given much access to any coaching. There's no structured leagues below. I mean, we're making some improvements, but essentially U13 down, the kids are not playing any sort of organized football. They might be playing up, so they might be 11 years old and, and on the under 15 team and getting five minutes at the end, but they are not playing week in, week out as they would be maybe in the UK or, or in America. So you're looking for the environments that are promoting them to, to have a football at their feet, even if they're just by the side of the field, they're, they're playing with their older siblings, they're in and around football. And so some of the key factors 
as you come into a new environment and, and this is a process that I now engage in exclusively to make sure that I'm not wasting time, that I'm open to, to learning and, and making sure that, that what I have in mind is going to be successful is firstly, how is football perceived in a wider community? And there is a connection with football as a young person that's kind of very pure, very open, and, and our love of the game makes it the global game. But in different environments, football can have had a, a history of success, could have had a, a history of, of things that are slightly more complicated than that. And, and essentially, you have to identify whether football was seen as a, a thing that young people should be engaging in, that's something for them to aspire to be. Do they have role models? Are there people that have used football to change their lives? Or, again, I'll use Grenada as an example, really, and especially with women's football, which is, is the role that I'm in, it's seen as a distraction. It's seen as something that cannot be aligned with doing well in school, Medical care is not free here. So if, if the girls are getting injured, that's an extra expense for the family. It's not something that a lot of their parents, it's not, not something that a lot of the wider community are going to promote to them. It's something that some of the girls that are coming to our national team program will use money that they might be using to go to school or for their food for the day. They'll use that for their bus money to come to a training session. And so we have to be aware of of what, what is the, the wider environment that they're engaging with football? And, and so how do we make the football program more beneficial to them? Who do we need to appeal to? On this same topic is, is what is the approach to young people and education in the country that you're in? So Uganda, Cambodia, Grenada, they're, they're rote learning systems. So they are, you come to the classroom, the teacher tells you what to write, what to know, and that's it. There's no guided discovery. There's no Q and A. Um, and you, as a young person, begin to get blacklisted if, you, if you're questioning, if you're asking, if, you're, if you hold the teachers or older people in, in any way responsible or accountable, that's not promoted. And, and so if you're talking about working with the foundation phase, and I guess that's going to be the wider talk that we have today, that isn't something that in a lot of countries they think is beneficial. They don't, it's, it's really uncommon. It's, it's a big, big thing. I mean, especially when I was in Uganda, one of the biggest problems is age cheating. There are guys who are 25 saying they're 17 and it comes from a wider mentality, a, a, a more embedded in mentality that young people need to wait. It's not their turn yet. You have to, you have to bide your time. Uh, and so, Again, if you're coming in with the idea that you're going to get stuck into the foundation phase, you're going to apply these principles, but the, the people that you're working with don't have any interest in it, you'll start to hit roadblocks. And it's something that I've seen over and over again. What are the underpinning cultural tropes of the players you're working with? And, and I think, so I'll take my time in Mexico. I was working in Mexico uh, delivering the Curva program. And, and I love the Curva program. I think it has so many benefits. But that's a culture of street football. That's a culture of, of kind of very extrovert play. And so ball mastery, basic kind of ball familiarization, they already have it. I mean, they're playing so young there. They, they love that style of football. They, it's, it's not that applicable. It's, you have to then move on to your game models, your game understanding, like how do you use that natural approach that natural engagement in football that they have how do you then make that a, a more team-based a more tactical environment or, or, or yeah set up and so until you understand why they're playing football how they play football what the what the approach to football is what do they see football as it's very difficult to develop your your overall program because you might be teaching them things that they already know and you're not going to get the the outcomes that you're looking for and then at the end of it is, is what is the intended goal of your program? And, and so I've worked in grassroots. I've worked at national level. I've worked at kind of elite level, uh, elite academy level in these different environments. I've also worked on lots of programs. I've worked in like a, a youth prison. 
what is it that you're trying to get out of football? Here at the moment in Grenada with, with the girls' football, we are trying to link football and education. So we're trying to use the national team program to show that girls can go out and get scholarships, that it can be something that's life-changing in a way that the community have never seen before, in a way that they, they always thought that football was a distraction. It was something that was not going to lead to anything. Um, and so if we can, we can make that twist, we can make that change in perception, we can get more girls playing, they can, they can use it to do something with their life. Um, and so, yeah, in the end, when you're writing your football program, more than the, the technical, the tactical, what are you trying to get out of it? What is the intended benefit of, of what you're doing? Your most important thing, once you have your football program, once you're in there and, and you've, you've listened, you've spoke to all the key people, you've, you've taken your time to understand what the environment is, what, what the needs, what the requirements are, is then to identify who are the key influencers at the age group that you're focusing on. So if we're talking about the foundation phase, what is the setup of, of the country or, or neighborhood that you're working in? Here, I would say broadly at schools football, the kids, if they're playing anything, are playing a, a small, uh, maybe a three month school competition at the, at the end of the year. Um, in other environments, when I was in the Cayman Islands, it's, it's a lot of the national team programs are where the engagement with football at the younger age groups are. Um, in Uganda, it's nothing essentially. So unless it's individuals doing coaching for their, for their programs or, or like the program that I was working on where we went and selected, but we also did some community programs. You then need to work out, so who are those people that are working with those players and how do you embed the ideas that you are trying to get across with your football program? How do you embed it in them? How do you empower those coaches, those influencers? I mean, we're going to talk about the football at home. Is it parents? Do you just need to find a way to connect with previous players could be or, or people who are interested in football and give them those ideas that are going to run and, and, and gain momentum so that by the time you are working with those players, they already have the ideas in their head and, and your football program can succeed. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, brilliant, Harriet. So, uh, yeah, a nice little overview then of uh, how you uh, approach sort of uh, each each uh, challenge that you've faced when you're uh, introducing different programs to different areas, um, which kind of sets things up nicely, I think, for, for Paul. Tell us a little bit more then about uh, his work at Houston Dynamo, uh, along with Tom Byer and, and the uh, Soccer Starts at Home program that uh, we're beginning to introduce in H-Town. Great. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about kind of our, our journey here in Houston so far. Um, I came on in, in uh, August of 2018 and to be the Academy Director here in, in, in October of 2018, I had the opportunity to meet Tom Beyer, who is this gentleman right here in this picture right here. Um, I had heard about Tom Beyer for, for many, many years um, from his work in Japan and, um, you know, had really, you know, it, it had been really interesting to kind of watch it, hear his, his ideas and his philosophy. I, so he had the opportunity to come to Houston and I met him and we invited him out to do a presentation for a bunch of our different little partner clubs throughout Houston. Um, and I have a map here of Houston and I put the map of Houston on there um, every now and again because it's a big city. It's the fourth largest city in America, the most diverse city in America, and has roughly about 7 million people. So I always think of Houston as less of a city and more of a country. It's got more people than Uruguay. It's got, um, you know, uh, a lot of people. It's a country. So when we brought Tom in, started to, to, to speak with him, he showed us the presentation on Soccer Starts at Home, and it blew my mind away. Um, in, in the ideas and the, and the philosophy of it, because it's really more of a philosophy than anything. Um, and it really, on this bottom left slide, you can see from the early ages, that's one of the slides out of his presentation, which is developing an attitude where it's my ball, learning to protect the ball, learning to be confident. But the main takeaway that, that I got from Tom's presentation was the, 
the parents are the key. Uh, parents are the key to all, all top development in, in a lot of really well-developed countries. Um, so I brought this to our general manager, uh, Matt Jordan. I brought it to our president of our club, uh, John Walker, who you can see here with Tom, and, and even to our first team coach. So we've all really, really embraced these concepts and these ideas to bring this philosophy to our city slash country. So the, here, here's a little slide that I made up to kind of show kind of how I understand it from, from what I've been learning. Um, you see the ages down here, ages one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way up. And we 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 kind of call this grassroots ages, you know, five to five to eight, five to nine. And then we have a, what we call our foundation phase, which is around nine through 12. Really, really, obviously, really, really important ages for development. It's these ages here, ages one, two, three, four, five, six, right up there, before they cross the line into organized play that we feel are critical. And, and what, you know, Tom really, you know, one of the many little light bulbs that went on when I was watching the presentation, if you see every top player and you look back um, and you uh, connect the dots going backwards, they most likely had a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister that introduced them to the soccer ball um, at the very, very early ages, two, three, four, five. And so we're, the other part of it too is that even in these ages, the ability to start to develop skills and, 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 and master the ball rather than just kicking it away was also a critical, critical element. So instead of kicking the ball, it's mastering the ball with both feet. And what we're starting to find out, what science is starting to find out is that this ball mastery and this skill acquisition at the younger ages does not only have a lot of physical and emotion, physical and you know, obviously coordinative benefits, but also a lot of emotional benefits because the parents are involved and a lot of cognitive benefits that the, you know, the kids are, are developing their brains through, through um, doing the ball mastery. So this is kind of you know, the basis of, of where we're, we're starting to take um, our programming. So we started off doing kind of parent workshops and parent workshops, you know, to go reach with local clubs and to start to show them that basically the presentation of how soccer does start at home for top, top players and top well-developed countries. Uh, in Brazil, they have a ball at the feet from the early ages. Probably in UK, you have it, the ball at the feet a lot at the, at the very, very early ages. In America, yes, we have the ball at the feet sometimes, but it's really from a mom or a dad that maybe knows soccer, right? And um, we have five major sports in America. So a lot of times kids aren't exposed to, to the ball early. So we started off with parent ignitions. You can see a couple there. This was all pre-COVID. And, you know, we wanted to get the ball rolling with, with these ideas. This is a, this is a great little video um, of one of the parents that came to the parent ignitions. This is a, uh, uh, a mother, she's Vietnamese. She had never played soccer before, but through the parent ignition, she kind of just got it, right? She had started to understand the major concepts of engaging with your child at home, a small ball, um, mastery of the ball rather than kicking it away, and then starting to give them some emotional support. This is her little daughter. I got this video like a week later after her the parent ignition, she sent me this little video. So this is little Anna Beth, three years, 10 months. Um, on really day one of this is kind of what it looks like when you're just okay. starting out. I love girls. Good. I love girls. Okay. So what you're looking at is cognitive development as well, right? And there's some emotional development. And this is all starting in the home. You can see she's using only her right foot, right? And it's it's Gary. She's starting to control it, look at it. That was really, really good. This is the video just one week later. Um, and she, the first week we were doing a little 15 week challenge and she starts to do this, what we call the slide. So you see, even in one week, 
the development was happening, right? So we created a little, we created a great website, uh, which is houstondynamo.com and backslash soccer starts at home. It's got a lot of videos and a lot of tips for parents. Um, this is a, a little bit of a skill builder card there. So we really started to get resources out to families uh, about this message. But really what we, we started to realize is that, you know, all these kids that we were speaking to had already, were already in a soccer club, right? So we were doing parent ignitions with clubs. So we thought that the real, real ticket here is the schools, right? The schools are where you have kids that have never played soccer before, right? So how do we, if we really want our country, our city, our country to be marinated in, in development and in technical development, we want to start to work with the schools. And so we started to create a, a school-based PE wellness program and started to, and this was during COVID, started to work with some really um, great key uh, educational leaders and meeting with educational leaders um, about the philosophy and about the benefits. Um, and again, everything starts very early, cognitive, coordinative, social, emotional development. Um, a big concept in Soccer Starts at Home is focused attention. The ability to focus your attention on, on a skill, even if it's for a minute or two minutes or three minutes, five minutes, that focused attention we believe is the learning switch to all sorts of development. Okay, when a kid can, 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 can focus, begin to focus. And obviously the growth mindset. So really the idea was to um, you know, start to get this in more schools. This is another quick little video of a young boy, uh, the mother had gone to another parent ignition and, and she sent us this little video right here. This little William at home, again, just a great example, right? Of it starting at home and he's got ball mastery rather than kicking the ball. There's, there's resources like the video is not that great, but it just got this literally the other day you know, how it translates to the field. This is little William now. And, you know, you can see he's super, super comfortable on the ball and he's, he's getting there. So it's that, that flying start into the game when you start at home. So we, we've really are working um, closely with an unbelievable, um, school partner, KIPP Texas. Um, they're the number one charter school in the United, in, in Houston. And we've started to create a, a pilot program where we're going out and starting to work with their PE teachers um, and develop this program. So I'll, I'll just kind of end with this right here. Uh, it's a nice little video of, of, of what we're started here in Houston with KIPP. So that's uh, it's a little bit of what we started here. Uh, there's obviously a lot lot into it, but um, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun, and we hope to introduce the game to a lot more kids through the program, and obviously start to marinate them and, and, and engage with the parents and connect the PE class with the regular classroom, and then also back to the parents, which is really really ultimately what we feel is the key. 
Uh, brilliant. Thanks a lot for that, Paul. Um, I think, yeah, we'll see a lot to delve into through from all three presentations. But we'll say we'll start with the, the soccer starts at home and some of the, the key pillars there. And probably that one, the key one, I think, when you're looking to connect with, with parents is that kind of idea of focus, attention and the learning switch. And it's also with the cognitive development, which I think you mentioned, there's a little bit of scientific research behind that. I don't know whether you could tell us a little bit more about, about that. Yes, for sure. And I'm, I'm just learning about it, you know, now. Um, and, you know, I think it, it all starts with, um, you know, the child having the ability to kind of bring their focus to the, the acquisition of that skill. And also, you know, the development of, of these neural pathways that aren't developed a lot. You know, we have a lot of things with our brain and our hands, you know, with phones and this and that and the other, but developing the pathways from the brain to the feet in a ball mastery um, is, is not always something our kids do, right? Um, you know, to teach a parent the difference between, you know, soccer being, a, you know, a kicking sport and a ball a sport about controlling the ball moving the ball, manipulating the ball, um, controlling it with both feet. So, you know, all those things, all those skills that you see, you know, require, require the, the child to, to have some focused attention, right? Um, and so what you see early is, you know, um, kids struggle with the move, struggle with the ball mastery skill, but the parents are able to give them the encouragement and, and understand development at these ages. And then these young kids start to um, slowly but surely, they start to get very, very comfortable with this, which leads on to the other skills, which leads on to confidence, which leads on to, you know, when they go to their first team or their first practice, they have now had that flying start, which again builds the confidence, right? Like that little boy, William, that you saw in the video. So, um, yeah, there's just many, many layers to it um, that, uh, that we feel are very, very positive. Now, let's bring in Mitch, uh, see at QPR. I mean, in terms of that, I don't know whether it's something that you are aware, been aware of and you have been involved in your own program, but just generally, what are your, your thoughts around that connection with that early age ball mastery and, 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 and its influence on focus, attention, and, and cognitive development. Yeah, um, being familiar with the, with the ball is important. I was gonna ask Paul a question, how, how, it, how does that relate to fundamentals of movement and how young people move without a ball? Yeah, it, it's important. Like if you really look at a, like a top, top level player, you guys see them all the time, right? And how well they move, right? Mm. As as compared to a player that's just becoming familiar with the ball, right? And how their body's moving. That's through thousands of repetitions, you know, in one, some way or some form, right? So um, we feel this is also, yeah, it's great for a physical movement, being able to, to, to uh, stop a ball, change direction. All that stuff is mastery of the ball. So, um, in our methods, in our, in our school program that we're devising is we basically have three met methods. The, the first method is what we call the focused 15, which is basically where you're, you're focusing on a ball mastery skill. So it's more in tight. So there's less movement, but there's still a lot of really cool, interesting, important soccer type movements, right? Uh, then we have more of a discovery dribbling where they're free and they're dribbling all around and actually changing directions and moving and, and doing different things that's, um, speeds them up and slows them down. Um, and then we play games. So between the focus 15, the, the discovery dribbling and games, you know, we feel we, we touch upon most everything that we can in, in a, for instance, in a 40 minute PE class. And how, um, how is it combined with other sports? I, know, I mean, I know you're up against huge sports in terms yeah. of America. Um, how, develop those transferable skills yeah i think we're in a different maybe in a different situation than maybe the uk 
in that you guys are, you got it. That's, that's the sport, right? You know, football is, is, is it it's life over, over here? Yeah, you're right. Exactly right. We have football, American football. We got basketball. We got baseball. We got, we got almost everything, right? We have five major sports. So all these kids are the, the great majority of the kids that, that we're reaching have never played soccer before, right? Um, when you first go to a PE class here and you raise your hand, how many of you have been on a team? There's not too many, right? So it's really, for us, it's a, it's a growing the game. It's a growing the game initiative as well, right? To introduce that ball to the child as early as possible and help them fall in love with the ball, right? Because it's kind of what Harry was saying before that about the, these kids that really want it. But when a kid, when a kid falls in love with the ball early, um, that's, that sets off the, the switch that they can, they can go and play and, and learn and go for, for years and years and years. So, um, you know, Neymar, Neymar's dad was one of the inspirations to Tom, you know, when he, when he had read quotes that Neymar, when he was young, he said he did not fall in love with the game of soccer. He fell in love with the ball, right? He fell in love with the ball and, and moving the ball and controlling the ball. Right. We have players here um, like Christian Ballistic, right, who's on who's on Chelsea, American player. Right. But if you connect the dots back on, on Christian Ballistic, his, his father was a soccer player. Right. He had the ball at home. Um, he was doing stuff at home. So you're connecting these dots backwards on all these top players. The other thing that we feel is really, really important is that it's not just about the elite player and it's it's about every every child. Right. Because you want to get every child to, to, to fall in love with it, with the ball and, and gain the benefits from it, whether it's a physical benefit or a cognitive benefit. And by increasing that, the, the improving the development at the base, it's going to be driving everything a little bit forward and higher. So we focus on every child and um, we focus on, on ball mastery rather than kicking it and connecting with the parents. We're going to bring in uh, Harry. Uh, Harry, your your thoughts on on uh, what's there has been discussed, or, or any questions that you have? I mean, I think from my experience that football often can be for for children at the age that we're talking about. If you give them that that toolbox of of mastery and and skill, often it can be the, the one thing that they they're competent at. They might be struggling at school. They might not be having the best time at home but they come to an environment where they know what to do. They get positive affirmation for it. And I think fundamentally that's in all the environments that I, I work in. That's why we try to work with that age group and we try to give them that set of skills because I think there's a lot of dynamics within a, a training session or, or a, a PE class or, or however, whatever the setup is. And I, I mean, there's a lot of talk in the UK about letting the game be the teacher and I think there's an element of that that's really interesting and, it, and it's definitely around conditioning your sessions and, and trying to embed the learning or, or hide the, the objectives of the session. But children have different personalities and often uh, the, the smarter ones or the, the more sensitive ones will, will make a judgment about themselves. And so if they're not competent with the ball, they will give the ball to somebody else or, or the, the, the most uh, the best kid in the class, they will give the ball to them and they want to be on the winning team. And, and again, this is a, a big conversation in the UK about when do we teach winning? But I've never met a kid that doesn't want to win. They all want to win immediately. And, and they're smart enough to work out how to win. And often that can be the kid that has been training at home or their, their parent was a footballer or they've had the ball earlier than the rest. They'll just keep giving the ball to that player because they know that in the end they'll find success. And I think it is, it's fundamentally important that we give all of them that basic level, that foundation with the football so that those dynamics don't kind of create this imbalance. As, and Because it, it only, it, it, it's exponential. It gets more and more. So the, the player that's touching the ball more, that's scoring more goals, gets more affirmation. They get more opportunity to play and the rest begin to lag. And so then we have these ideas around when they, they're being recruited in, into an under nine or an under 10 team, that this kid is a good player. 
but we've already given up on on young people and, and that was one of the things that i really struggled with when i was working in the in a uk academy system is these kind of value judgments when they don't do enough research into what's the backstory how many touches of the football as, as a child had and then how can you be deciding where they're at without that information yeah i think that's a that's a weakness harry definitely of the the uk system um we look at spain where they're keeping players all the way till 21 22 um you know you only have to look at kind of maturation ages and see that some 16 year olds when they're released uh you know, not even you don't fully grow to your 30 or something like that so uh yes definitely and i'm just um going back on the game as the teacher I, I'm a huge advocate of games-based uh, coaching, but the game's not the teacher for me. You're the teacher, you're the coach, uh, but the game the game is a, a way of getting your messages across um, and getting your technical points across. And what we do a lot of, particularly in school sessions, is that sort of regression. So we may all start with a 2v2, 3v3, 4v4 game, and then we'll go, okay, they know what we're working on, be it dribbling, whatever. And then we'll break it down and go, okay, go and get your own ball now. Think about what you saw in that uh, position when you're up against two players defending or you've got two supporting and you need to break down three defenders. Now think about what you can do individually with the ball. How can you manipulate the ball to help your teammates, to create a space for your teammates? And then we'll throw them back into that 3v3 and go, right, now use that and show us. Um and that's where our kind of basis of games-based stuff. But Harry, you're absolutely right. You've got to have the tools to be able to be in a game uh, to start with. Um, we're really lucky to have you know, Chris Ramsey as our director at the academy. Absolutely nailed on with technical detail, you know, learning those uh, 15s, I think you call it, Paul. We have an equivalent here. You know, getting those technical skills in, um, and then being able to use it in a game at the right at the right time, and, and then developing that decision making absolutely. Um, but it's still for me, and I know I bang on about it, particularly in our school sessions, goes back to those relationships. Can you forge the relationships with young people to be able to develop them as footballers? Um, it amazes me that in the last few years now we're talking about oh, isn't Jurgen Klopp brilliant with his players? Uh, you know, the recent recent uh, Sadio Mane incident where journalists tried to make something out of nothing, I think. Um, and he quickly said that the relationship we've got is amazing. So, you know, without that, you don't have the ability to develop people, I believe. Uh, and that's what we try and do within schools, whether that's be with young people, with teachers, and then like Paul's talked about, with parents as well. You know, if we show them our four whys, they'll go, oh, actually, you're trying to help them be the best they can be. But you're also making sure they have fun uh, and making sure they fall in love with, you know, physical activity. And obviously that bonus of being involved with QPR as well. Um, so, and the point of wanting to win, you're absolutely right. Kids do want to win. But it's the difference between where parents, you know, winning is what matters but that's different to wanting to win you know the parents are still thinking about some of the grassroots results on a monday morning in the whatsapp chat um well the kids on the way home all they're thinking is are we get mcdonald's or you know am i going to play minecraft with the kid across the road later you know that's all they're thinking about and that's something that i always remind coaches about yeah. and if you can start to think like that as an adult as well you move on quicker and then you develop people better, in my opinion. Um, talked a lot about flow as well. And then how, trying to get kids to lose themselves. Think about how we played football when we were young. You know, and you, you, the trophies, wins, and this comes from a guy called Rupert Spira. Trophies, wins, they're all at, at best a symbol of uh, a moment. But actually the real happiness comes from when you just forget about everything else in life and you're playing football. And that's kind of the key that we kind of get to our coaches in schools um, when they can forget, like Harry said, they can forget about everything else that's going on, what's going on with their parents, what's going on with their home situation. Football's that one thing that they might have 
Um, and that's really, really key for us. And I think that helps that technical development as well, Paul, from where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting because it's, it's uh, there's different cultures that we're talking about here. You know, Harry's in a different culture. I'm in a different culture than, than we're all in different cultures. And you know, you're talking about the game in a way that I'm also like, uh, we're trying to get to there, right? Where it's that that much in the system, you know, how you're talking about. So for us, as far as the Grow the Game initiative, that's why these schools and programs are so good. But yeah, I mean, for me to see, um, you know, over this 12 week program that we've begun, you know, with the kids to see them improve in just 12 minutes, a kid that on day one had never, never seen the ball really, or never knew what to do with the ball, right? To see them, you know, six, eight, 10 weeks later to be able to control the ball and dribble it, right? And to know that maybe they only did it you know, Mitch, they only did it twice a week. We still haven't connected with the home, right? That's amazing how much development can happen at these early ages. So that that's really interesting. Now imagine if, you know, you were able to connect with the mom or the dad, right? Uh, and, and give them a tool chest of things, right? And and to show them that this is not only, a, this is not a soccer program. It literally is not a ball mastery or skill program. This is a parent and child engagement program. And the benefits that you have to spend with your child in these, these minutes every day, in some way, encouraging them and playing with them, you know, that, that's, that's really powerful. So how do you articulate that? And how do you, how do you design programs? You know, I'm, again, I'm speaking for the United States and in Houston, right? How do you create these programs that can connect to those parents, right? Um, yeah, so it's it's amazing, and, and you have uh, you know you have a lot of PE teachers here in the states, for instance, that really soccer is not their number one thing, right? So if you can teach the teachers, right, and show them and convince them and provides a good program, and they get comfortable with these concepts, there's a lot of PE teacher education, right, and then reaching the school teacher, the actual classroom teacher, go, listen, you know, we're having this program and we're doing ball mastering, we're connecting here and here, and this is how it potentially can help that child do better in math, right? Or in reading or in English. Now the parents, they click on to something completely different. It's much more than a soccer program, right? This is a child development program. This is a wellness program. And, um, and we feel that you know if we're able to make these connections and hopefully we get more and more families and more and more kids that are engaging at home at an early age and, and doing so in a way that it improves, marinates them in, in the ball. You know, and during the COVID, it was really interesting, right? Because people were coming to us and they were like, hey, you know, the kids are all at home, right? You know, do you have programs where I go, hey, yes, we do. It's called Soccer Starts at Home, right? And, and, and here's, 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 here's what you, you just need your bedroom, right? You just need a hallway. You need a small ball. You know, here's some general tips, you know, here, here's some videos, go check out the videos at the site and engage with them. And, and there you go. So, um, yeah. It's, you get the teacher pool that um, takes away sport or football as a punishment for not doing uh, something in maths or English. And that's probably a whole different webinar, Steve. Yeah. But um, I, I think so. Yeah, let's let's not take the ball away just yet. So yeah, that's it. Although I might lead us then into a got a question here, which goes out to all the presenters from Emira Rahman, um, and he asks, uh, what are the biggest barriers, challenges that you personally have encountered in environments you work in, and what plans have you put in place to deal with this? Uh, that's from Emira, who's. Uh, they're involved with Metropolitan Police Youth Girls Football. I can start off, fellas, if you, if you, if you don't mind on this one. This one's Go for it, Paul. It's, it's that connection with the parents. It's, it's, it's building that connection with the parents. And, um, you know, we've had different, different methods to do that. You know, we're doing a, we're doing a pilot study right now with uh, really great partners, University of Houston, um, 
is helping us with a study on, on this on this program. And part of it is, you know, engaging with the parents. And how do you increase that parent engagement? So we've done we've done some parent workshops to do that. You know, we're we're even into the point where we're we're calling into parents, certain parents, and and giving them some instruction on it. Um, but if we can find a way, you know, a, a way to to engage the parents, I think everything everything takes off at a new level. You know, the kids that come onto the the kids with the engaged parents, you know, um, are are supporting them in everyday activities in life, right? And you have the you have the opportunity to to kickstart everything off if you can reach the parents. So for us. The parents are the key. Uh, Harry, uh, your answer to that question? I think the, yeah, the biggest challenge here really has been uh, with the coaches, with, with the coaching culture in general. I mean, I've never been in an environment where the players get on board very quickly. Is it like, as long as you engage with them, you show them a bit of, care like you really invest in them that you can get the players on on board very quickly um regardless of, of kind of what approach you're taking or, or what the the outcome is but here as i said there's a very much a, a focus on on adults know everything and and children know nothing and so trying to change that dynamic trying to get the coaches to accept that the players are allowed to give feedback even, even around the demonstrations. And, and this kind of goes back to what, what Paul said. A lot of the coaches here can't demonstrate the techniques that I want them to, to demonstrate and they're shy to do it. They don't want to make a mistake. And I keep trying to remind them that it doesn't matter. I mean, that's part of the process is if we're encouraging the players to take risks, to, to try new things, then as a coach, we have to be a role model. And if we mess up, then like own it. And it, it doesn't matter. Like it, it builds a relationship. If the players laugh at you, if they have an opportunity to, to have fun at your expense, then that connects you in a way that, that maybe you would never make before that. Um, and so, yeah, for me, that, that's really where I'm working right now. And the honest answer, as far as I'm concerned and, and from my experience is I'm trying to take some of our kind of U20 national team players, some of the girls that are in football right now and make them coaches because it's much easier to relate their experiences that they've they've been through and that they're going through right now and show them how it can be done differently to maybe the coaches that have, have been here for 30 40 years and they they think they know the game they played the game um that's a really long battle um and, and in terms of kind of benefit or, or outcome i would rather bring the next set through and, and in, invest in that process um obviously we, we're trying to to change the ones the existing ones but it's definitely the young ones that are picking up the information, they're seeing it, they, they come to me with questions and they say, oh, I thought about today how I gave feedback to one of my players. And it's, it's when I see that, that I think we're, we're making a little bit of progress. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the biggest challenge here. I, I just kind of jump on that one too. It, it's the most important phase of development for me uh, is the grassroots ages hands down, the grassroots and the pre-grassroots. So what, what, what Mitch is doing, right, I think is, is the most important. And it's the least valued, I think, and it's the greatest numbers of kids. And if you can do a great job, if countries can do a great job in the grassroots and the pre-grassroots, you know, um, and take advantage of those incredibly valuable years from four to eight, you know, um, I think, you know, I think you're, you set yourself in, uh, up for success, you know, not just for high level elite players, but also just for the, the enjoyment of the game for many, many years, you know, in soccer for life. So um, it's getting, getting organizations, soccer organizations to, to believe that and see that, you know, you know, when I first came here, you know, I, you know, to, you know talking with Veron clubs and they're, they're, they're struggling to find players at U12, U13. Well, what happens before U12 and U13? Look deeper, look into the sixes and sevens and eights. What's happening in those ages? Look into your club. I mean, are you, 
are you are you providing them real genuine development and even look even before that right so um you know people invest a lot into uh, you know facilities or coaches high level coaches or this or that or the other if we invested into the grassroots more and in proper proper development at the grassroots education of the parents again and, and the clubs even then um again you know, you're starting the ball rolling in the right direction early, so. Um, we do, Mitch, well, it's the, one of the, the challenges that you've that you've faced before we bring it all, all together. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Paul. It's all about education. I mean, I've tutored for the FA on level ones and um, the stuff that we kind of take for granted that we know as coaches, parents that are becoming coaches, they're amazed by it. They're amazed by the fact that you can, you know, you don't play a 10 v 10 training match in a under nine session. All like, oh, right, well, how do we change it? It's like just showing those bits and pieces to parents, educating them to see how it goes and parents are becoming coaches. Um, so the, the challenge, I suppose, is a bit threefold for me, really, because I do a bit of grassroots stuff as well. The, the challenges in grassroots here are still a little bit similar to what Harry's probably facing in bigger quantities, is that we still have parents and coaches that view an under-10 game as the most important thing of the weekend. You know, and, and we have coaches that don't play certain players because they want to win the game. It's a challenge. That it's a huge challenge. It's changing that mindset around and actually, you know, a bit of equality and equity. It bring everyone up at different stages, you know, with equal playing time and bits and pieces that ain't grassroots football. And you'll end up with more players when they're older. You know, and Paul talks about dropout. I should go and watch an under 15 game with your boys and girls, and they'll, they'll both have 11 players and you know, no subs. That'd be because when they were 10 and 11, for some reason, their coach has put them off it. Um, not giving them game, game time, not making it fun, not making it accessible, not making it relevant to them. So there's, there's the education of parents as coaches and parents as parents as well at grassroots level. In terms of school delivery and education, well, where do I start? It's like we still have this kind of archaic education system where PE will be the first one to go. Um, got a daughter in year six, we'll stop doing PE when SATs exams come around the corner. You know, so it's a huge change at kind of policy level, but something up there has to stop um, to put PE and all the benefits it brings with it, whether that's you doing football or basketball or rugby within the sessions, has to be put up there at the top. Um, you do get some head teachers that get it, which is brilliant, and they, they have as much importance on it as other things in their school but that's the challenge and then underneath that because of that teachers within primary schools um, are less inclined to want to deliver PE uh, and they're less skilled and they're less knowledgeable which is where our coaches go in alongside them try and upskill the teachers to be able to deliver those fun engaging challenging PE lessons um, you know, there's some more university degrees coming out around PE primary stuff. So that'll be really, really good. And, you know, for a few years, academies in the country have got a bit of a hard time. But actually, I think the coaches within academies get it the most. They, they get the fact that kids are still kids and they're still coming along to enjoy their football. Yeah, there's a, there's a different kind of element to it at the end of it. But I think, you know, forget about that. We're going to develop you during the week on something else. We'll move on again. Um, so I think there's still loads of work to do on education and grassroots football here for sure. Some brilliant coaches that get it, but some coaches and parents who are still, you know, it's the most important thing to them on the weekend is winning the match. Um, yeah, loads to do. Yeah. Mitch, it's uh, sometimes like, you know, it's also just like an organizational structure, right? Of like, we, there's a parks and recreation, you know, 20 minutes down the road, right? 700 kids, you know, four, five, and six years old. And they're actually playing 11 v 11, right? So those poor people, 
they don't know that, you know, these kids are all going to drop out, right? When you play, you know, you know, one ball and 22 kids running around the field, no fault to their own, but they need that support. You know, even people to come in and show them, you know, these different ways to do it, how you organize it. And I'm sure you guys have all heard about the Belgian 2v2, right? What does the kid want to do? He wants to dribble and score, right? So how can we teach that organization? All right, this is, this is how you can set up these dribble festival celebrations, right? And you can do this. You can even do this to all the grassroots clubs around. Play 2v2, play 3v3. And, and play it at four, five, six, seven, eight, and, and, and go, right? So there's a lot of education still um, that we have to do in our country, for sure, you know? I, I was gonna ask Mitch, uh, for your programs with Queens Park, uh, what ages are you starting the programs at? And kind of what does it look like when you go into a school? And, and So we're really lucky, we're really lucky, just on a previous point, we took some, uh, development teams to Man United. All they did was 4v4, 4v4 all the time. And you know what? They left one member of staff as a safeguarding uh, manager and the coaches went, do you want to go and get a coffee? Like and they could, they just watched from the balcony and then the kids played 4v4, did their own subs, but, you know, played on their own. Safeguarding manager was there, was, you know, parents were there, that sort of thing. But that, 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 Giving away that control by coaches is huge, you know. And the kids are making they're making decisions, and they're going actually. I'll go and play up top for a little bit. Um, but on our programs, we we're really lucky to have support from from the Premier League in terms of our community programs and the Premier League charitable fund. So we get funding to go into schools for the Primary Stars program, and that starts at uh, reception, which I suppose is kindergarten for you guys, Paul. If I've got that right. Um, starts a reception with that sort of fundamentals of movement and then goes all the way through to uh, age 11 in primary schools. Uh, and that involves supporting the PE teachers mainly. We're alongside the teachers helping them to develop their PE programme. Um, so then eventually when we move on, fingers crossed, they'll have a better idea of what PE should look like and then how that will support developing footballers as well. Um, do, Paul, do they do it in a, kind of a blocked fashion where they'll, they'll do soccer for many weeks in a row or do they do it, you know, just interspersed and, in, in, you know, do, and are they, how, how does that work? With the, yeah, with so it depend, depends on the year group. So early years we'll do real um, movement stuff for a whole year you know, around movement, but we'll incorporate sports into that. So the, the topic may well be um, just moving you know, for a five-year-old, just move, we're just going to do moving for six weeks. But then each week you might go, right, this week we're going to use football as the catalyst for moving. Next week we'll use uh, dance as the catalyst for moving. And then through that, and then as they get older, um, teachers still love to break it up into, well, we're going to do rugby for six weeks, we're going to do hockey for six weeks. And it's like, okay, well, let's, let's still cling on to that movement stuff. And that developing the technical skills across all sports, but okay, we'll do that. And then, um, so yeah, changes through those key stages. Um, normally around nine or ten, we, we can start to think about sports a bit more in our program. You know, but right up until then, we're not we're not particularly specialised you know, within schools. Got it. Harry, in your your experiences where you've sort of been in cultures where that sort of making that connection with parents and getting the parents on board at a younger age is not possible. I mean, what were the what have been the solutions around that? I mean, I think it's our role as a coach, and I think it's something that's it's not acknowledged enough that we sometimes think that it's just the kids and that's, that's your job. You're there to coach the players. But I've seen like from very, very early that if you aren't putting that extra half an hour, that extra hour in after the session, you aren't doing the job properly. You're not understanding what the potential impact that you can have because you can have it two ways. So right now in my program, I would say maybe 10% of the parents have any interest in what the girls are doing. Like you might see one or two parents come with the girls, the rest of them, sometimes the girls are not even in the country and the parents are barely aware 
where they are. But you can also have parents who are on the other end who have a, a really active interest, but maybe they don't have the, the skill set to be able to, to focus that interest in a positive way. And so you might put on the most engaging, the most enjoyable, positive training session. And then that car ride home becomes a nightmare for the child because it, it's a review. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that's not positive to them. So it's about making sure that we give the time to them, show them, talk to them, hear the, what they have to say, make suggestions. But you have to build a relationship with them as well. Like that, that's the thing that, that takes time. And, and hopefully in the process, they will understand if they want the best for the child. And they always do, obviously. There's a way to do that. There's, there's a way that there's, you're going to have more positive results. And then on the other, other side, as I said, is about me going out. I mean, a lot of my role here is going and visiting parents, going and sitting down with them. They have work commitments. They, they don't really understand why the daughter should be playing football. And it's about me showing why and, and, and getting them to trust me. And, and I definitely feel a lot of pressure here having those conversations because I now have to deliver. I've gone and I've, and I've said to them, this is what football could potentially do when I must make that happen now. I have to, I have to be part of a process that shows them that their trust was, was valid, that it was, it was a, a good thing for them to engage in. That's something similar for you as well, well Paul. I mean, in, in Houston, like you say, in the, in the Republic of Houston, as we'll call it, we're sort of calling it the size of a country. Um, you know, very multicultural uh, city. Um, so there'd be large parts of it where there are fifth, sixth generation families where, you know, they've been passed on, that everyone's played football from great granddad to great grandma and, and down. And likewise, and where I would like to focus is, particularly probably your focus is, is those families where there is no history of soccer in that family at all. I think yes. you may have given one example in your videos, but how is it you're making that connection with, with those families? Yeah. I mean, you know, education involves like helping the student and, or the child kind of develop a strong background of, of knowledge or, or comfort, right, with the ball. So again, you saw that video of the, the, the Vietnamese mother who was giving that child that, that background, right? And making that readily accessible. And it takes an unbelievable amount of time to become comfortable with a soccer ball at your feet. And that's what Tom Beyer did in Japan. I mean, they were on TV for 15 straight years with a little soccer corner, boom, that went up with a skill of the day. And so why you see that the, the Japanese, the women have won the World Cup at the 17s, 20s, full national team and how technical they are. They marinated that nation in, in technical development, right? So the most effective teachers um, really kind of ensure that these students are, are, are acquiring and rehearsing these skills, right? Where else is the best place in the world to do this? Where are you all the time? You're at home right? You're at home. So again, it, it's for, for that connection to really, really happen. You know, yeah, you, you practice two, three times a week. That's great. It's, it's providing the parents with the support. It's providing the teachers with, with the, the education so they can model and guide this. Um, and, and so you're not going to reach everybody for sure. There's no way, right? But if you can reach just a percentage a small, small percentage of the many, many thousands of kids, for instance, in Houston, that this message is getting out, if just a small percentage of them um, took to it, right? So you're in a room with, with 100 parents or 20 parents, and four of them catch on to this, right? That's four more than you had before, right? And again, earlier the better, right? It's better at four than it is at eight or 10 or 11 or 12. And, and what you do is you try to create this culture of development one home at a time. And a lot of times the, the, the culture keepers then inspire other groups, right? All of a sudden, you know, the other kids are doing it and these kids are doing it. All of a sudden you, ha you, you have the connection between, you know, the school and now it's in home. And now, you know, kids want to join a club. A lot of these kids here that we're working with in KIPP, 
have no thought of ever being in a club. It's not England, right? It's not what they, a lot of these kids don't have the, the, the resource to get the type of, you know, little skill development that we're doing with them. So man, we're just stoked. We're stoked that more and more kids can be introduced to the ball in this way, but it, it's, uh, it's definitely, it's, uh, I'm not even going to say it's a struggle because I know, I know it's, uh, it's all part of it. It is, it's a, a joyful journey to try to reach these parents. And um, we know it's a long-term process as well. It, it's, you know, perspective on that, right? This is going to take many, many years to start to develop this culture here in Houston, but we're, we're we've started. So just quickly with, with, with the Dynamo, you're also working across the dash. You're also working with boys and girls with this program. Yes, I'm the academy director for the boys, um, but where our club, you know, has a professional men's team, Dynamo, and a professional women's team, the Dash. So yeah, no, we're excited because you see in the videos there all the little little girls that are getting introduced to soccer. Man, and they just they can get a hold and they start getting some comfort on the ball and introduced to the ball these girls are amazing right so yeah excited about that i don't know whether, whether this is something that is maybe a, an advantage of the soccer culture in the u.s but is there a differential between you know, if you're talking to the parents of young boys versus young girls is it more a of great, an uptake that's a great question we're, we're we're collecting data on a lot of different things you know we're, we're trying to figure out who came on to the parent workshops you know, so we had 197 kids in, in our first pilot study, you know, a group that, that got the full soccer starts at home program. And we had through quite a bit of hard work, but we, we've, we, had, we had some good parent engagement, but also, you know, not even close to, to the engagement that you can get. And so we'll find out more numbers on that. But uh, yeah, I don't know if it's, if it's boys or girls or more, but um, what we do know is when the parents are engaged, um, you know, the learning takes off. I mean, on that, Mitch, you, something you find, is there a, again, differential between boys and girls, even at the community level in terms of the buy-in you get from teachers, parents? I think um, there's a difference slightly in mindset around it. Um, like Paul says, the boys tend to have this, and I have to say I was one of them, I'm going to be a footballer kind of thing. But the girls are much more, I'm doing this because I really enjoy it. And I think for some reason, the boys tend to maybe lose that sense of freeness playing, um, whether that's outside influences or whether it's because becoming a pro is potentially more attainable for a boy. I don't know, but um, I think because our program involves so much around movement and different sports, particularly in schools, it's, 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 it's across both boys and girls. So we've got a really strong girls and women set up just starting our first college scheme uh, for girls this year, which is really cool. Um, but even, even in that, the boys come to the college scheme and you know, still got dreams of becoming a pro or a semi-pro. The girls come in and the first thing they ask is, what are we doing education-wise? You know, what, what am I learning in the classroom? And the football is that kind of added bonus for them. Um, but I think, I think with all of it, it's a case of, like Paul says, just the earlier you can educate the parents to understand the benefits of playing the sport generally, but obviously football as well, um, is, is key. Uh, what's really sad is that, you know, working within two football clubs in London is that boys sometimes have that actually, there's only two ways out of their lifestyle and that's football or a gang. So imagine that, imagine being a coach, one of those guys and in an academy and, you know, they're finding it hard. It's, it's a pressurised environment that they get at home and then come to an environment which some people perceive as pressurised as well. So that's why, from our point of view, it's all about that relationship, fun, enjoying yourself, 
forgetting everything else that might be going on at home. You know, so. Um, um, likewise, Harry, um, obviously uh, your role at this moment in time is sort of very focused on on women's girls football in, in Grenada, but in your experiences overall, is that again something you've you found again to be, to be typical that uh yeah you probably get more buy-in from families of of boys than than girls? Or is it just a case of changing your approach? I mean, yeah, I think definitely it comes down to like tangible outcomes and it, it comes down to there's a history of, of, of a pathway for boys. Um, I've been in lots of environments where there's been successful female players and, and or there's a, a, an environment that encourages them to play. Um, Singapore, especially, we had a massive girls program out there. Um, and so we had girls four or five coming along and, and lots and lots of numbers, especially at the younger age groups. Um, so I think it's, it's easily changeable like it's it's not something that takes very long to to fix but traditionally it is that the boys are, are promoted to play and and it's because there seem to be some sort of outcome to it um but i would also agree what what mitch said that i would say the girls here have a much purer relationship with football than the boys do there is a a, a level of of perceived pressure from the boys very early on they have to play for the national team. They have to do this. They have to do that. And so it becomes a status thing. And, and so there's a lot of social dynamics around the way that they play football. Whereas the girls, there's so many barriers to them playing that they, they're there because they want to be. They're there because like the amount, whatever amount of beatings they get from their parents or the amount of people that criticize them, they don't care. They just want to play. Like they'll, they'll come regardless of, of anyone's opinion or how the result is, whatever. They just come. And I mean, it's one of the things that, that really like enriches the, the experience here is just being able to, to work with them and, and encourage them and, and give them kind of whatever skills I have to, to support and, and develop their football because they're just like, they love it and they, and they want to be in football as much as they can. Uh, I think again, kind of coming back to one of those uh, earlier themes you picked up on about attitude. And I guess, um, that is something that comes from within or is that something as a coach you can help draw out? Well, I mean, part of my role is to increase participation. So I'm not doing very well, if I'm honest at that, that's like still a big, big struggle because there's a kind of, uh, I guess, a, an organic refining process here where the girls with that motivation, that intrinsic kind of desire to play football are the ones that I coach. And so I'm having to really find ways to, to engage the ones that maybe are a little bit interested, but not, not particularly interested. And, and then they don't, they struggle to have boots here. They, there's a lots of barriers to entry. And so in, on that side of things, they're kind of filtered out uh, essentially. Um, and I'm trying to find ways to, to stop that. Um, I would say, it has kind of two sides to the coin though, because the girls just come to play, like they just come and they play. And, and even at national team level, as I said, what we're trying to use is the national team programs to then move that into education, move that into something that becomes a, a lifelong uh, pursuit. And they don't, a lot of them have never even thought about it like that. They never even imagined that there was a possibility that football could go anywhere. And so we've had a lot of very difficult conversations around that. Like, me asking them what what can you do with your football you have the talent like it's now about putting together a set of goals and objectives and us moving in that direction um and i say we have a few of the the members of the the older group who are beginning to latch onto it and and it's kind of percolating through the the younger groups but in general they come because they love the football they love to be around football they want to play and it's now giving them that kind of hope, giving them a bit of a dream as well. I mean, we don't want to change that. I, don't, I would never want to remove that, but I would also like them to aspire a little bit and, and see that it, they make all this sacrifice. They have such dedication. Why not get something from it? Why not like let it allow you to travel, go and get an education, do whatever you want, essentially. 
And Paul is Academy Director at Houston Dynamo. I mean, ultimately, what is the what is the why behind all of this? Introducing this this whole program. I mean, is it ultimately just to produce the two, three players who will go on to be Dynamo players, or is there a, there is more more to it than simply that? Yeah, there's there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, Hundred percent. It's um, it's about the wellness and of the child and the family and improving that improving that connection again it goes goes well beyond soccer you know so we're trying to create a PE program and a wellness program that that is cognitive development social development uh, in improving parent child engagement you know and also giving validity to the PE teacher right as a real teacher uh, versus just someone going out there and spending some time with the kids, right? Because it's, we have a kind of a great quote here came from Julia Stepech, uh, who, who was our director of education. When when we showed her the presentation, she said, Paul, she, she was just lit up. She was like, Paul, the, the ball is like a book. I'm like, yes, exactly. The ball is like a book, right? You know, they talk about reading with your child 20 minutes a day. But when a child is, you know, doing the ball mastery, do we not think it, it's that cognitive development the same way as reading a book? It is most definitely. And, and so, so again, I think um, the why is there, there's so many whys to it. You know, there's so many whys to it. I, I was going to show this. I don't know if I can show them here, but I've got this like card right here. This is what we call the skill builder card. And it's a little girl named Genevieve, right? She may never go on to play for the U.S. national team, but she engaged with her mom, you know, all these days in the month, right? And she was she was feeling successful when she when she when she you know mastered a move, right? And that's the the stuff that you know all, all of a sudden she's gaining a confidence that she can do something in a classroom or she could be do this or do that. She's learning to have a growth mindset. Um, yeah, of course, there's coordinative benefits, right, and, and, and soccer benefits, but it, it, there's so much more to it than that. Obviously, um, likewise, Paul, um, you, you're part of a community trust, although, you know, there's a part of what you do would like to feed into the kind of elite development, but ultimately, what is what is the goal with uh, with your program? Um, I think it's similar to... to Harry and Paul as well. It's that we talked about our whys right at the start as well. So helping someone to be the best they can be. And that is about being a person as well as a potential footballer. Um, the other whys, yeah. Yeah, we, the reason we want them to be involved with QPR for life is because we're a genuine community club. Um, and there's a role for everyone supporter, player, coach, admin, volunteer, whatever, steward, it doesn't matter. Um, and then myself personally, I do believe being physically active is is a kind of cornerstone to strong mental health. Uh, and the, the best things for me, and I'm lucky enough to have coached some guys that have gone on to play pro, but it's the ones that you see now down the street with the family and their kids and you know they're polite people and they stop and say hello and they chat about what they're doing now and some of them are still playing uh someone i taught is now a manager in norway um and that's why you know to to help other people to help those young people become you know more students of the game more kind of as Paul talks about, like what we call cultural architects, and why do we do it? Because we love football, you know, and we want other people to love it as well. That was kind of nice to yeah, sort of maybe as a as a final end question, which you've kind of then hit upon, Paul, for the other guys is yeah, we've had the the organisational whys, but yeah, what are your own personal whys? Why why are you investing so much of yourselves into this game to help? To help others personally um 
it's I, I guess man that's, that's that's a great question personally it's it's about uh, it's about helping people and helping them learn how to grow and, and and seeing them progress and develop and everything everything like that and you know i uh i'm all i'm all about trying to to help share development you know and and inspire development so uh, that's my why fantastic thanks paul uh, harry i mean football has just offered me such a unique way to connect with people i mean there's no there's no other area of my life where football uh, where where i've been able to to have that bond and and it it kind of it, it creates an openness it creates this kind of i don't know i mean I, i've struggled to find the words but i yeah every day is just is a joyful experience whether it's here in grenada like whatever part of the world i've been in football connects in exactly the same way and whether it's with an adult, whether it's with a child, like, yeah, I mean, I feel a real debt to, to football. It's allowed me to do so much from when I started playing to, to coaching now. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just so happy, so grateful to do it every day, essentially. Lovely. Um, Mitch, I don't know, you want to sort of add anything on top of uh, what you were saying previously? Yeah, so that, like Harry said, that connection is unbelievable. Like, I think back to when you were a kid and for me, I'd go to, I don't know, Butlins or Pontins holiday camp or something, and you just play with kids you'd never met before, uh, and they they call you QPR because you had your shirt on or whatever. But like I said, seeing those people that have developed, you know, it's about giving back to people. And I know we've talked about that. I talked about relationships a lot, but I remember the first PE teacher I had that invited me to the grassroots club. You know, and I'll, I'll remember going up the steps at Loftus Road for the first time. And now I say hello to people that I've sat next to for years and years and years. And it's it's those relationships through football that is the reason that just keep doing it. Uh, I'm living the dream and working for my my club, you know. I, I, uh, I think it's just awesome what you're doing, both you guys, you know. Um, I think, it, you know, Harry, you know, you, you're taking this world journey man as a young guy you've hit all these countries and you're getting tastes of cultures all over man I, I i can i can imagine every country is probably a little bit different right yeah yeah of and, course and, and and mitch is in mitch is in the the mecca you know along with some other of you know spain and other great countries he's in the mecca and i'm in a developing country with with you know 300 million people right so the the why the whys are all going to be very you know you, you want people to grow you want people to develop i mean i i want our country to to develop you know and so that's probably another why is is you know if if we can show them here how important these younger ages are in our country right and, and show some good work you know that's also uh, uh will be a good step so as best friends my best friends are from football playing coaching that's right it's a game for life as well isn't it right so, it's a game for life you know yeah. i'm still recovering from playing 90 minutes of vets football yes <laughs> right. oh, fantastic guys think of that draw a veil on it on it there which is what you say is that way of connecting through the game relationships which is uh brought us all together here and uh sacrificed this uh, another 90 minutes probably this hopefully this 90 minutes wasn't as uh, painful as yesterday's for you mitch it's been a pleasure steve thank you cheers guys thanks guys well, thanks uh, for getting up so early uh us time pleasure pleasure steve uh, absolutely thank you for having me on and then likewise harry although uh like any, I guess, getting up to see the sunrise uh, on a Caribbean island is no hardship. Yeah, I'm not going to complain. It's been a real pleasure. Great to meet he, all of you. He's leaving there, and he's going. He's going snorkeling right now. <laughs> yeah, straight to the beach. <laughs>